What we're going to be talking about today is uh, something called the new video. Since it's new, we don't know where it's going. We only know what we're seeing right now. And it's, it's promising. Now, if the pen is mightier than the sword, what about the picture? Think of a picture of daffodils, a color picture of daffodils. And then think that the, of a picture of daffodils where they're, where they're blowing in the wind. And then when there's some beautiful violin quartet playing in the background. And then you have this picture that can instantly, virtually instantly, be transmitted to everyone's desktop computer, millions of people. Now, <clears throat> what effect is that going to have? I think this is a big unknown, basically. But what we're going to attempt to do today from this huge universe of videos that are out there, uh, we all took some trouble to try to select for you a real variety of videos. Some of them are very polished and thoughtful, and a lot went into the production. Some are simply raw footage that people have taken uh, in the streets. I want to say one word about the history, or what at least I consider the history of the video, of the power of the video. You may all remember that, and it's the power of the video to reach people, to reach people through the internet. You may remember that in the 1970s, the ancestor, in a sense, of this medium took place when the Ayatollah Khomeini was in exile in France. And he made probably tens of thousands of audio tapes. And how he got them distributed all over Iran, I don't really have any idea. But we do know, it's, it's fairly well established, that he was responsible, and this move to distribute audio tapes to his supporters uh, in Iran was the reason why the Shah was deposed. Now, think about that. The audio cassette is really out of date now. But if the audio cassette, which is a much weaker instrument and was distributed by hand, could have this kind of political effect, just think a while what this new medium, the videotape that people get on their computers, what the potential is for this. It seems to me that it's enormous. Now the first video that I am going to show is a polished video. And I don't have to explain to a group like this what it means and what it's about and all the subtleties, because you'll pick this up. But there is an interesting disconnect between the tone and the affect of the narrator of this video and the content of what he's talking about. And you'll, you'll notice this, obviously. But this is, this is a, a technique that I think is very effective. And I'm not going to explain what this video is about. I'm just going to play it. Marcos Aguilar, the principal and founder of the Academia Semillas de Pueblo School, and Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa are both former members of the UCLA chapter of Mecha. Mecha was founded for the sole purpose of radicalizing young Latino students with a hatred for America, Chicano pride, and separatism. Returning the American Southwest to Mexico was the stated goal in the late 60s when Mecha was founded. But today they seek nothing less than control of the United States either by ballot box or by armed revolution. 
While Antonio Veragosa was president of the UCLA chapter of Mecha, he engineered the removal of the director of the Chicano Study Center. Antonio claimed the director was trying to alter the concept behind Chicano Studies by refusing to include the Communist Chicano Group National Committee to Free Los Tres. Antonio demanded communist inclusion within UCLA's Chicano Study Center. In 1993, as a member of Mecha, Marcos Aguilar, along with other Chicano radicals, trashed the faculty center, causing $50,000 in damage. Marcos and nine other students then went on a two-week hunger strike demanding that Chicano Studies program be given departmental status. They sought the creation of a Chicano Studies major at UCLA, and eventually the school chancellor gave in. When I was a high school teacher at Garfield High School, one of the largest high schools in the United States, most of the Mexican children there had lost a sense of identity because its own administration and the general policy of the Los Angeles Unified School District is in fact to Americanize Mexican and African American children in Los Angeles. And they would argue that that's good. Um, I believe that that's not good. Today Marcos Aguilar runs his own charter school for grades K through 8. The school is funded by state taxpayers and the National Council of La Raza, or the race. Most of the students are children of illegal aliens. They are taught Chicano pride, Aztec mythology, and Aztec math. The school teaches primarily in Spanish, but it also teaches Mandarin and the ancient native language Nahua, which is now used by members of the Mexican Mafia. Nowhere in the Constitution of the United States or in the Declaration of Independence does it say that because you come here, you have to now become an American. English, math, and American history take a back seat to Danza Azteca, a traditional form of Aztec Indian dance. This is Marcos Aguilar beating the drum on July 4, 1996. Americans had gathered to celebrate Independence Day and rally against illegal immigration. Marcos Aguilar was there along with other Chicano radicals in protest. And we claim this land is ours, it's always been ours, and we're still here. And uh, none of this talk about deporting. If anybody's going to be deported, it's going to be you. The United States is who is the immigrant here, not us. Marcos's school earned the lowest possible scores on the statewide academic performance index, meriting a 1 on a scale of 10. Go back to the Plymouth Rock! It also ranked the lowest out of all charter schools in the Los Angeles Unified School District. They may not score the highest on API tests, but the success there is that they didn't commit suicide and that they graduated from high school. The people united will never be defeated! If not committing suicide is a measure of success for Marcos Aguilar, then he must be extremely proud of Juan Alvarez, seen here dancing beside him. Marcos Aguilar taught at Garfield High School, where he met Juan Alvarez. This is a yearbook photo of Aguilar in the Danza Azteca group that he founded. On the opposite page is Juan Alvarez in the Mecha Club. In January of 2005, Juan Alvarez parked his Jeep Grand Cherokee on the Metrolink railroad tracks in Glendale, California. He then stood by as an approaching passenger train smashed into it. The train derailed into another train traveling in the opposite direction. Eleven people were killed and nearly 200 were injured. After the crash, Alvarez raised his arms into the air and fell to his knees. He then fled the scene and visited a friend from the Danza Azteca dance group. He poked himself in the arms and chest with a pair of scissors, which at first had some believing that he had tried to commit suicide on the tracks. But the wounds were only superficial, and eyewitness accounts along with evidence at the scene pointed out that Alvarez had doused the interior and exterior of the vehicle in gasoline. He was hoping that the vehicle would explode on impact. Perhaps a better explanation of why Juan Alvarez murdered 11 innocent people is because he took his Aztec beliefs to the extreme. The school became notorious. Its unusual teaching practices and failing test scores were impossible to defend, but Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa issued a statement. He supported the school and its teaching philosophy. Even though it focused on Chicano pride, a hatred for America, and racial separatism, he said it was protected by the First Amendment right of free speech.